Broadcasting Live from 1855, it's your lady, Marchana Cell, signing on. Hello everyone, I'm back one week later as I had promised. I think that is a very podchamp moment. Okay, so today we are going to begin off where we left off um, reading Frankenstein last, um, last Saturday. We were, we just finished chapter three. Um... Yeah, so, I realized, um, post, after the stream, that I probably should have been writing, taking notes of these chapters, because I kind of forget what was going on, but I kind of remember. So, last time, um, last time on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, we, um, started out meeting our guy named Robert Walton, I believe some free-spirited guy he likes sailing and whatever he's writing letters to his his sister um, Margaret I think yeah I think it's Margaret and basically on his journeys he met this really raggedy guy um, in like the North Pole and stuff <laughs> pulls him on board whatever and this guy's been through some stuff eventually this guy and Robert, they get come close, they become close, just friends, and eventually the guy tells a story, and his name hasn't really been said, like, directly, but I think we've all gotten that this guy is Victor Frankenstein, um, <laughs> and basically starts off saying his childhood, he, um, often read, like, these books about actually I don't do any research on what the books he read were about but from what I got from it they're basically like pseudoscience stuff about fountain and youth and stuff like that and yeah but so, so he goes to college and he meets this professor who tells him that all his education has been garbage and yeah and then he meets another professor who says you know that's good these guys are the foundation um, science and stuff. <laughs> I don't know, or maybe maybe he didn't say that. I I really wasn't paying that much attention. And yeah. So that's where we left off. And today we're gonna finish. Uh, and today we're gonna read as much as we can. I've got my Mountain Dew. I've got my water. I've got. That's all I got. chat but you know whatever things happen <laughs> okay let me just let me just check that it actually does work okay <laughs> day, natural philosophy, and particularly chemistry, in the most comprehensive sense of the term, became nearly my sole occupation. I read, I read with ardor these works, so full of genius and discrimination, which modern inquirers have written on these subjects. I attended the lectures and cultivated the acquaintance of the men of science at the university, and I found even in M. Crump a great deal of sound sense and real information, combined, it is true, with a repulsive physio- <sighs> starting off the words that I can't say. 
with a repulsive fizzy oh you know me and manners but not on that account the less valuable in m waldman i found a true friend his gentleness was never tinged by dogmatism dog dogmatism and his instructions were given with an air of frankness and good nature that banished every idea of pedantry pedantry i don't know how to say that word either in a thousand ways, he smoothed for me the path of knowledge and made the most abstruse inquiries clear and facile to my apprehension. My application was at first fluctuating and uncertain. It gained strength as I proceeded and soon became so ardent and eager that the stars often disappeared in the light of morning whilst I was yet engaged in my laboratory. <laughs> in my laboratory. Um, these character names. So, uh, M. Krem is the professor that said, um, our guy's reading material was garbage, and Waldman is the guy, is the professor who said that his reading material was okay. Okay. As I apply so closely, it may be easily conceived that my progress was rapid. My ardor was indeed the astonishment of the students, and my proficiency that of the masters. Professor Kremp often asked me, with a sly smile, how Cornelius Agrippa went on, whilst M. Waldman expressed the most heartfelt exultation in my progress. Two years passed in this manner, during which I paid no visit to Geneva, but was engaged, heart and soul, in the pursuit of some discoveries which I hoped to make. None but those who have experienced them can conceive of the enticements of science. In other studies, you go as far as others have gone before you, and there is nothing more to know. But in a scientific pursuit, there is continual food for discovery and wonder. A mind of moderate capacity which closely pursues one study must infallibly, must infallibly arrive at great proficiency in that study. And I, who continually sought the attainment of one object of pursuit, and was solely wrapped up in this, improved so rapidly that at the end of two years I made some discoveries in the improvement of chemical instruments, which procured me great esteem and admiration at the university. When I had arrived at this point and had become as well acquainted with the theory and practice of natural philosophy as depended on the lessons of any of the professors at Ingolstadt, my, my residence there being no longer conduct, conducive to my improvements, I thought of returning to my friends in my native town when an incident happened that protracted, when an incident happened that protracted my stay. One of the phenomena which had excuse me. I just ate dinner. <laughs> and I it, it was like an hour, um I say like six fifteen I had dinner. So I kinda like scarfed it all up. So I'm a little gassy. But ladies don't say that. One of the phenomena which had peculiarly attracted my attention was the structure of the human frame, and, indeed, any animal endued with life, whence, I often asked myself, did the principle of life proceed? It was a bold question, and one of, and one which has ever been considered as a mystery. Yet with how many things we, upon, we are upon the brink of becoming acquainted, if cowardice or carelessness did not restrain our inquiries, I revolved these circumstances in my mind, and determined thenceforth to apply my to apply myself more particularly to those branches of natural philosophy which relate to physiology. Unless I had been animated by an almost supernatural enthusiasm, my application to this study would have been irksome and almost intolerable. To examine the causes of life, we must first have recourse to death. I became acquainted with the science of anatomy, but this was not sufficient. I must also observe the natural decay and corruption of the human body. In my education, my father had taken the greatest precautions that my mind should be impressed with no supernatural horrors. I do not ever remember to have trembled at a tale of superstition or to have feared the apparition of a spirit. Darkness had no... Excuse me. Darkness had no effect upon my fancy, and the churchyard was to me merely the receptacle of bodies deprived of life, which, from being the seat of beauty and strength, had become food for the worm. My gosh. Now I was. Oh my god. <laughs> now I was led to examine the cause and progress of this decay and forced to spend days and nights in. 
vaults and charnel houses. I don't know what that is. Um, my attention was fixed upon every object the most insupportable to the delicacy of the human feelings. I saw how the fine form of man was degraded and wasted. I beheld the corruption of death succeed to the blooming cheek of life. I saw how the worm inherited the wonders of the eye and brain. I paused, examining and analyzing, <laughs> examining and an analyzing all the mi mi minutiae of causation as exemplified in the change from life to death and death to life, until from the midst of this darkness a sudden light broke, broke in upon me, a light so brilliant and wondrous, yet so simple, that while I became dizzy with the immensity of the prospect which it illustrated, I was surprised that among so many men of genius who had directed their inquiries towards the same science, that I alone should be reserved to discover so astonishing a secret. So, I think everyone knows the basic story of Frankenstein, that he makes life, um, and the life turns back on him, or something like that, right? So, he's definitely putting that in my notepad. Interest in the relationship of death and life. And we remember in, um, I don't remember the previous chapter, the chapter before that, uh, he said his mother died. Um, his sister was sick, and his mother nursed her back to health, but in turn seemed to have gotten the same illness and then died. So I'm going to put arrow um, inspired by the survival of his sister and death of his mother. Actually, narcissism and brother, they're cousins and probably incestuous. But I'm ignoring that for now because, you know, 1818 novel. Okay. Remember, I am not recording the vision of a madman. The sun does not have more certainty shine in the heavens than that which I now affirm is true. Some miracle may have produced it, uh, yet the stages of the discovery were distinct and probable. After days and nights of incredible labor and fatigue, I succeeded in discovering the cause of generation and life. Nay, more I became myself capable of bestowing animation upon lifeless matter. Well... <laughs> The astonishment which I had first experienced on this discovery soon gave place to delight and rapture. After so much time spent in painful labor, to arrive at once at the summit of my desires was the most gratifying consummation of my toils. But this discovery was so great and overwhelming that all the steps by which I had been progressively led to it uh, were obliterated, and I beheld only the result. What had been the study and desire of the wisest men since the creation of the world was now within my grasp. Not that, like a magic... Um, not that, like a magic scene, it all opened upon me at once. The information I had obtained was of a nature rather to direct my endeavors as soon as I should point them towards the object of my search than to exhibit that object already accomplished. I was like the Arabian who had been uh, buried with the dead and found a passage to life, aided only by one glimmering and seemingly ineffectual light. I see by your eagerness and the wonder and hope which I express, my friend, um, that you expect to be informed of the secret which I am acquainted. That cannot be. Listen patiently until the end of my story, and you will easily perceive why I am reserved upon that subject. Sorry, I was getting cold, so I just put on a shawl. Um, uh, I will not lead you on, unguarded and ardent as I then was, to your destruction and infallible misery. Learn from me, if not by my precepts, at least by my example, 
How dangerous is the acquirement of knowledge, and how much happier that man who believes his native town to be the world than he who aspires to become greater than his nature will allow. When I found so much When I found so astonishing a power placed within my hand, I hesitated a long time concerning the manner in which I should employ it. Although I possessed the, capa although I possessed the capacity of bestowing animation, yet to, yet to prepare a frame for the reception of it, with all its intricacies of fibers, muscles, and veins, still remained a work of inconceivable difficulty and labor. I doubted at first whether I should attempt the creation of a being like myself, or one of simpler organization, but my imagination was too much exalted by my first success to permit me to doubt my ability to give life to an animal as complex and wonderful as man. The materials at present within my command hardly appeared adequate to such arduous an undertaking, but I doubted not that I should ultimately succeed. I prepared myself for a multitude of reverses. My operations might be incessantly baffled, and, and at last my work might be imperfect. Yet when I considered the improvement which every day takes place in science and, and mechanics, I was encouraged to hope my present attempts would at least lay the foundations of future success. Nor could I consider the magnitude and complexity of my plan as any argument of its impractic... 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 It's, a, it's impractical. What? Impractic... Why can I not say this word? As is impracticability. <laughs> Whatever. I don't care. Impractical. It was with these feelings that I began the creation of a human being. As the minuteness of the parts formed a great hindrance to my speed, I resolved, contrary to my first intention, to make the being a of a gigantic stature, that is to say, about eight feet in height, and proportionally large. After having formed this determination, and having spent some months in successfully collecting and arranging my materials, I began. No one can conceive the variety of feelings which bore me onwards, like a hurricane, in the first enthusiasm of success. Life and death appear to me ideal bounds which I should first break through, and pour a torrent of light into our dark world. A new species would bless me as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. No father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve theirs. Pursuing these reflections, I thought that if I could, could bestow animation upon lifeless matter, I might in process of time, although I now find it impossible, renew life for death had apparently devoted the body to corruption. Hmm. He's really in over his head. I write that down. He is very prideful. I mean, I guess makes sense. I would be prideful if I were in secret to animating the dead, right? But, I don't, I don't know. It feels like the, um... His ego is getting to him, and that probably is what leads to his downfall. But we'll see. Um, these thoughts supported my spirits, but I pursued my undertaking with unremitting ardor. My cheek had grown pale with study, and my person had become emaciated with confinement. <laughs> Sorry. Sometimes, on the very brink of certainty, I failed. Yet still I clung to the hope which the next day or the next hour might relieve, um, which might realize. One secret which I alone possessed was the hope to which I had dedicated myself. And the moon gazed on my midnight labors while, with unrelaxed and breathless eagerness, I pursued nature to her hiding places. Who shall conceive the horrors of my secret toil as I dabbled among the unhallowed damps of the grave or tortured the living animal to animate the lifeless clay? My limbs now tremble and my eyes swim with remembrance. But then a res resistless and almost frantic impulse urged me forward. I seemed to have lost all soul or sensation, but for this one pursuit. It was indeed but a passing trance, but only made me feel with renewed acuteness so soon as, the unnatural stimulus ceasing to operate, I had returned to my old habits. 
I collected bones from charnel, charnel houses and disturbed with profane fingers the tremendous secrets of the human frame. In a solitary chamber, or rather cell, at the top of the house, and separated from all the other apartments by a gallery and a staircase, I kept my workshop of filthy creation. My eyeballs were starting from their sockets and attending to the details of my employment. The dissecting room and the slaughterhouse furnished many of my materials, and often did my human nature turn with loathing for my occupation, whilst, still urged on by an eagerness which perpetually increased, I brought my work near to a conclusion. The summer months passed while I was thus engaged, heart and soul, uh, in one pursuit. It was a most beautiful season. Never did the fields bestow a more plentiful harvest, or the vines yield, uh, a, or the vines yield a more luxuriant vintage, but my eyes were insensible to the charms of nature. And the same feelings which made me neglect the scenes around me caused me also to forget those friends who were um, so many miles absent, and whom I had not seen for so long a time. I knew my silence disquieted them. I knew my silence disquieted them, and I well remembered the words of my father. I know that while you are pleased with yourself, you will think of us with affection, and we shall hear regularly from you. You must pardon me if I regard any interruption in your correspondence as a proof that your other duties are equally neglected. I knew well, therefore, what would be my father's feelings, but I could not tear my thoughts from my employment, loathsome in itself, but which had taken an irresistible hold of my imagination. I wished, as it were, to procrastinate all that related to my feelings of affection until the great object, uh, until the great object, which swallowed up every habit of my nature, should be completed. I then thought that my father would be unjust if he ascribed my neglect to vice or faultiness on my part, but I am now convinced that he was justified in conceiving that I shall not be altogether free from blame. A human being in perfection ought always to preserve a calm and peaceful mind, and never to allow passion or trans transitory desire to disturb his tranquillity. I do not think that the pursuit of knowledge is an exception to this rule. If the study to which you apply yourself has a tendency to weaken your affections and to destroy your taste for those simple pleasures in which no alloy could possibly mix, then that study is certainly unlawful, that is to say, not befitting the human mind. If this rule were always observed, if no man allowed any pursuit whatsoever to interfere with the tranquillity of his domestic affections, Greece had not been enslaved, Caesar would have been spared his country, America would have been discovered more gradually, and the empires of Mexico and Peru had not been destroyed. But I forget that I am moralizing in the most interesting part of my tale, and your looks remind me to proceed. <laughs> Basically, he said, Hey, I, I, I am talking too much about boring stuff, and you just want to hear about the cool zombie person, right? My father made no reproach in his letters, and only took notice of my silence by inquiring into my occupations more particularly than before. Winter, spring, and summer passed away during my labors, but I did not watch the blossom or the expanding leaves, sights which before always yielded me a uh, supreme delight, so deeply was I engrossed in my occupation. The leaves of that year had withered before my work drew. The leaves of that year had withered before my work drew near to a close, and now every day showed me more plainly how well I had succeeded. But my enthusiasm was checked by my anxiety, and I appeared rather like one doomed by slavery to toil in the mines or any other unwholesome trade than an artist occupied by his favorite employment. Every night I was oppressed by a slow fever, and I became nervous to a most painful degree. The fall of a leaf startled me, and I shunned my fellow creatures as if I had been guilty of a crime. Uh, sometimes I grew alarmed at the wreck I perceived that I had become. The energy of my purpose alone sustained me. My labors would soon end, and I believed that exercise and amusement would then drive away incipient disease, and I promised myself both of these when my creation should be complete. Okay, so that is chapter four. What are your impressions on it? Oh, that's right. I'm the only one here. 
So, what are my impressions on it? Um, well, in this chapter, my guy is basically saying he found out how to animate life and what it started to make human. It's just a transitory transition chapter. So, in my notes, I'm right. Um, doctor. He's not a doctor yet, right? Ah, uh, he. Uh, finds out how to animate life and sets to tree command. Comma, faith based. Let's continue with chapter 5. Chapter 5. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me, that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open, it breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe, or how Dylan... <sighs> or how delineate <laughs> the wretch? Whom with such infinite pains and care I had endeavoured to form. His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful, great God! His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness. But his luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. The different accidents of life are not so uh, changeable as the feelings of human nature. I had worked hard for nearly two years for the sole purpose of infusing life into an inanimate body. For this I had deprived myself of rest and health. I had desired it with an ardor that far exceeded moderation, but now that I had finished, the beauty of the dream vanished, and breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. Unable to endure the aspect of, being, of the being I had created, I rushed out of the room and continued a long time traversing my bedchamber, unable to compose my mind to sleep. At length, the lassitude succeeded to the tumult I had before endured, and I threw myself on the bed in my clothes endeavoring to seek a few moments of forgetfulness. And I'm just going to interrupt it there. So this is definitely probably how the uh, conflict of this novel is going to be. Um, he creates life is what he has been working towards for the past year, I think it was. And now that he does, realize he doesn't like it. And I get that feeling, like, working hard on something, realize, I actually don't like this. I mean, this, this guy made some... Oh my gosh, I almost said a bad word. <laughs> I almost said a bad word, guys. <laughs> this guy he made a um, a monster, basically. Um, <laughs> more than some of my weird um, phases. <laughs> like, taking a month to learn French. This guy didn't take a month to learn French. He took a year to build a human from scratch. But, yeah, so... So, as soon as his dream came to fruition, he immediately regretted it. Let's continue. Um, and I threw myself on the bed in my clothes, endeavoring to seek a few moments of forgetfulness. But it was in vain. I slept, indeed, but I was disturbed by the wildest dreams. I thought I saw Elizabeth, in the bloom of health, wait, well, walking in the streets of Ingolstadt. Delighted and surprised, I embraced her, but as I imprinted the first kiss upon her lips, ew! Anyone want to hear a hot take? So, <laughs> I know they're not technically sister and brother, you know, she's the adopted 
adopted into the family, and they're not even related. But it's kind of weird. And I, I'm pretty sure if I ask people, they would think it's a little weird, but I, you know, whatever, it's the story. I guess I'll deal with it. However, <laughs> so there's this anime I watched the really long name. His name is something like, um, reincarnated as a villainous, but doom flags in my way, um, better kick them down or something stupid like that. Um, so, uh, the fan then just calls it Kamefura. Um, and I don't want to get too much into it because <laughs> I have feelings about it, but basically the main character, um, she has an adopted brother and, and like in blood, they're like, he's like, um, a very distant cousin, um, but he's adopted as a, um, younger brother and essentially he basically falls in love with her and I don't know. I just think that's the weirdest thing ever. <laughs> like, I keep, like, when I read fan fiction, it's not, I'm not, like, looking for people to say that. But I, I don't know. I just think it's so weird. And, like, does anyone else think that kind of thing is weird? Like, they were raised as siblings, so it's kind of weird to see them as a lover. I don't know. But, so, basically, Keith Clay's is kind of a weird guy. But he's cute, so it's fine. So, this, oh, this guy... Victor Frankenstein kissing his sister, at least. Yeah, he's kissing her in his dreams. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. I don't know. It's, it's just that it's weird. I just had to go on a tangent. Just had to go on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, delighted and surprised, I embraced Elizabeth, but as I imprinted the first kiss on her lips, they became livid with the hue of death. Her features appeared to change, and I thought that I held the corpse of my dead mother in my arms. A shroud enveloped her in form. Uh, a shroud enveloped her form, and I saw the grave worms crawling in the folds of the flannel. I started from my sleep with horror. A cold dew covered my forehead. My teeth shattered. My teeth chattered. <laughs> his teeth shattered right out of his mouth. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm in a really giggly mood today. Yeah. No, I I wasn't feeling too well this, today, so <laughs> I'm kind of feeling a little loopy. But honestly, when am I not? <laughs> I'm just laughing at his teeth shattering. Okay, a cold dew covered my forehead. My teeth chattered, and every limb became convulsed. When, by the dim and yellow light of the moon, as it forced its way through the window shutters, I beheld the wretch, the miserable monster, the miserable monster whom I had created. He held up the curtain of the bed, and his eyes, if jaws they may, may be called, were fixed upon me. Uh, and his eyes, if eyes they may be called, were fixed upon me. His jaws opened, and he muttered some inarticulate sounds, while a grin wrinkled his cheeks. He might have spoken, but I did not hear. One hand was stretched out, seemingly to detain me. But I escaped and rushed downstairs. I took refuge in a courtyard belonging to the house which I inhabited, which I remained during the rest of the night, walking up and down in the greatest agitation, listening attentively, catching and fearing each sound as if it were to announce the, appro the approach of the demonical corpse to which I had so miserably given life. Oh! <laughs> Uh, oh, no mortal could support the horror of that countenance. A mummy again endued with an animation could not be so hideous as that wretch. I had gazed on him while unfinished. He was ugly then, but when those muscles and joints were rendered capable of motion, it became a thing such as even Dante could not have conceived. I passed the night wretchedly. Sometimes my pulse beat so quickly and hardly that I felt the palpitation of every artery. At others, I nearly sank to the ground through languor and extreme weakness. Mingled with this horror, I felt the bitterness of disappointment. Dreams that had long been my food and pleasant rest for so long a space were now uh, become a hell to me. <gasps> and the change was so rapid, the overthrow so complete. Mm. My cat.
cat is just meowing at me. Alright everybody, cats in the room. Let's get a meow. Come on, say hi in the chat. Say meow. Just the cutest meow ever. So everyone has to hear it. Olivia. Meow. Look, in one hour, you're gonna be like, Okay, I'm done. Let me out. This is why I say I need a cat door in my room. Because I want my door closed. But I want my cats in. Right? Say meow. Do you want to sit in my lap? Meow. Meow. Oh. It's just lays down. Okay, let's continue where um I left off. <coughs> oh. Oh. No mortal could support the horror of that countenance. A mummy again endued with, a, with animation could not be so piteous as that wretch. I had gazed on him. I had gazed on him while unfinished. He was ugly then, but when those muscles and joints were rendered capable of motion, it became a thing such as even Dante could not have conceived. I passed the night wretchedly. Sometimes my pulse beat so quickly and hardly. Oh, I already read this one. Uh, morning, this mother wet, a limp dawn, and discovered to my sleepless and aching eyes. Mm. Morning, this mother wet, a limp dawn, and discovered to my sleepless and aching eyes the church of Ingleflat, its white steeple and clock, which indicated the sixth hour. The porter opened the gates of the court, which had been that night my asylum, and I issued into the streets, pacing them with quick steps, as if I sought to avoid the wretch whom I feared every turning of the street would present to my view. I did not dare return to the apartment which I inhabited, but felt impelled to hurry on, although drenched by the rain which poured from a black and comfortless sky. I continued walking in this manner for some time, endeavoring- <coughs> She almost knocked over a lamp. Um, I continued walking in this manner for some time. Endeavoring my bodily exercise to ease the load that weighed upon my mind, I traversed the streets without any clear conception of where I was or what I was doing. My heart palpitated in the sickness of fear, and I hurried on with irregular steps, not daring to look about me. Like one who on a lonely road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round walks on, and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth those behind him tread. Um, there's like brackets here and it says Coleridge's Ancient Mariner. I don't know if that's in the um, original novel or the, uh, in this PDF. Probably um, it's in the original novel and um, Shelly is just like telling us who she uh, who she's referencing. Um, but this is apparently 
a what? Uh, this is apparently a fragment of a poem by Coleridge. Ah, it's a poem by a fragment of poem by Coleridge. I don't remember his full name. Um, called the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Okay. Continuing this, I came at length opposite to the inn at which the various diligences and carriages usually stopped. Here I paused. I knew not why, but I remained some minutes with my eyes fixed on a coach that was coming towards me from the other end of the street. As it drew nearer, I observed that it was the Swiss diligence. It stopped just where I was standing, and on the door being opened, I perceived Henry Clerval, um, who, on seeing me, instantly sprung out. Um... Henry Clerval is his childhood friend. My dear Frankenstein. <laughs> is that what he sounds like? I, I, I tried to do a unique voices the last time I read this, but I forgot it all. I am not someone who is good at voices. <laughs> it's just very slight differences in my, in, in my uh, intonation. That's how I do different voices. <laughs> so, My dear Frankenstein, exclaimed he, how glad I am to see you. How fortunate that you should be here at the very moment my alighting. Nothing could equal my delight on seeing Clerval. His presence brought me back to my thoughts of my father, Elizabeth, and all those scenes of home so dear to my recollection. I grasped his hand and in a moment forgot my horror and misfortune. I felt suddenly, and for the first time during many months, calm and serene joy. I welcomed my friend, therefore, in the most cordial manner, and we walked towards my college. Clerval continued talking for some time about our mutual friends and his own good fortune in being permitted to come to Ingolstadt. You may easily believe, said he, how great was the difficulty to persuade my father that all necessary knowledge was not comprised in a noble art of bookkeeping, and, indeed, I believe I left him incredulous to the last, for his constant answer to my unwearied entreaties was the same as that of the Dutch schoolmaster, the vicar of Wakefield. I have ten thousand florins a year without Greek. I eat heartily without Greek. But his affection for me at length overcame his dislike of learning, and he has permitted me to undertake a voyage of discovery to the land of knowledge. Ugh. I don't like having making college seem like a good thing, because it makes me feel sad. Because uh, college is hard for me. I mean, it just depresses me, but whatever. I want to become a professional trophy wife. It's less work. I hate working. I mean, I hate working with my mind. <laughs> I'm fine with doing physical work. You know, my, my previous jobs have all been um, at restaurants. That's kind of poggers. Say what you want, but I actually like it. You know, I use my brain enough where I don't go crazy. Other than that, it's all physical, baby. It's all physical. <laughs> Whatever. Anyways, <laughs> it gives me the greatest delight to see you, but tell me how you left my father, brothers, and Elizabeth. Very well, and very happy. Only a little uneasy that they hear from you so seldom. By the by, I mean to lecture you a little upon their account myself. Well, my dear Frankenstein, continued he, chopping short, short and gazing full in my face, I do not, I do not perform remark how very ill you appear. So thin and pale, you look as if you had been watching for several nights. You have guessed right. I have lately been so deeply engaged in one occupation that I had not al allowed myself sufficient rest. As you see, but I hope, and sincerely hope, that all these employments are now at an end, and that I am at my length free. I trembled excessively. I could not endure to think of, and far less to allude to, the occurrences of the pre preceding night. I walked with a quick pace, and we soon arrived at my college. I then reflected, and the thought made me shiver, that the creature whom I had left in my apartment might still be there, alive and walking about. I dreaded to behold this monster, but I feel, feared still more that Henry should see him. Entreating him, therefore, to remain a few minutes at the bottom of the stairs, I darted up towards my own room. My hand was already on the lock of the door before I recollected myself. I then paused, and a cold shivering came over me. 
and through the door forcibly open, as children are accustomed to do when they expect the spectre to stand waiting for them on the other side, well, but nothing appeared. I stepped fearfully in. The apartment was empty, um, and my bedroom was also freed from its, its hideous guest. I could hardly believe that so great a good fortune could have befallen me. But when I, I became assured that my enemy had indeed fled, I clapped my hands for joy and ran down to Clerval. We ascended into my room, and the servant presently brought breakfast. But I was unable to contain myself. It was not joy only that possessed me. It was I felt my flesh uh, tingle with excess excess sensitiveness. Ew. I felt my uh, and my pulse beat rapidly. I was unable to remain for a single instant in the same place. I jumped over the chairs, clapped my hands, and laughed aloud. <laughs> Clerval at first uh, attributed my unusual spirits to joy on his arrival, but when he observed me more attentively. He saw a wildness in my eyes for which he could not account, and my loud, unrestrained, heartless laugh frightened and astonished him. <laughs> I just wrote the word DAZED in all capital letters in my notes. Yo, this guy, he already lost it. First day. First day, I'm um, creating an abomination of human nature, and he already lost it. <laughs> my dear Victor, oh my god, my dear Victor, cried he, what, for God's sake, is the matter? Do not laugh in that matter, how ill you are. What is the cause of all this? Do not ask me, cried I, mm. putting my hands before my eyes, for I thought I saw the dreaded specter glide into the room. He can tell. Oh, save me, save me. I imagined that the monster seized me. I struggled furiously and fell down in a fit. <laughs> Poor Clerval, what must have been his feelings? A meeting, which he anticipated with such joy, so strangely turned to bitterness. But I was not the witness of his grief, for I was lifeless and did not recover my senses for a long, long time. This was the commencement of a nervous fever, which confined me for several months. During all that time, Henry was my only nurse. Make out already. I afterwards learned that, knowing my father's advanced age and unfitness for so long a journey, and how wretched my sickness would make Elizabeth, he spared them his, this grief by concealing the extent of my disorder. He knew that I could not have a more kind and attentive nurse than himself, and firm in the hope that he felt of my recovery, he did not doubt that, instead of doing harm, he performed the kindest action that he could towards them. <gasps> I just realized something. So... No, uh-uh. Ah! Uh, why did I say that? Now I have to explain myself. Basically, this, this is the um, precedent of women writing, um, BL. <laughs> BL, yaoi, homosexual fanfiction. <laughs> <laughs> slash that's my hot take from this <laughs> it's actually um a work of bl <laughs> calling it bl is weird um boys love <laughs> okay um but I was in reality very ill, and surely nothing but the unbounded and unremitting attentions of my friend could have restored me to life. The form of the monster on whom I had bestowed existence was forever before my eyes, and I raved incessantly concerning him. Doubtless my words surprised Henry. Henry, he had first, um, he had first believed that uh, he first believed them to be the wanderings of my disturbed imagination. But the pertinency which I had continually recurred to the same subject persuaded him that my disorder indeed owes its origin to some uncommon and terrible event. By very slow degrees and with frequent relapses that alarmed and grieved my friend, I recovered. I remember the first time I became capable of observing outward objects with any kind of pleasure. I perceived that the fallen leaves had disappeared and the young buds were shooting forth from the trees that shaded my window. It was a divine spring, and the season contributed greatly to my convalescence. 
I also felt sentiments of joy and affection revive in my bosom. My gloom disappeared, and in a short time I became as cheerful as before I was attacked by the fatal passion. Dearest Clerval, exclaimed I, how kind, how very good you are to me this whole winter, instead of being spent in study, as you promised yourself, has been consumed in my sick room. How shall I ever repay you? I feel the greatest remorse for the disappointment of which I have been the occasion, but you will forgive me. You will repay me entirely if you do not discompose yourself, but get well as fast as you can, since you appear in such good mood spirits, uh, in such good spirits, I may speak to you on one subject, may I not? I trembled. One subject. Um, I trembled. One subject. What could it be? Could he allude to an object on whom I dared not even think? Compose yourself, said Clerval. You observe my change of color. I will not mention it if it agitates you. But your father and my cousin, uh, but your father and cousin, that's Elizabeth, uh, would be very happy if they received a, a letter from you in your own handwriting. They hardly know how ill you have been and are uneasy at your long silence. Is that all, dear Henry? How could you suppose that my first thought would not fly towards those dear, dear friends whom I love and who are so deserving of my love? If this is your present temper, my friend, you will perhaps be glad to see a letter that has been lying here some days for you. It is from your cousin, I believe. One thing I don't get, oh, this is the end of chapter five. One thing I don't get is why, like, they interchange calling each other by their first names and their last names, like, I don't know. Aren't they, like, the, like, really good childhood friends? So, like, um, I don't know. I feel like they just heard them do their first names all the time, but, uh, so a summary of this chapter, um, he, the monster comes to life. And he immediately regrets it, and then as soon as his friend Henry Clerval comes to visit, um, he realizes how uh, messed up it all is and has a nervous breakdown. And then the chapter ends that Elizabeth has sent him a letter. Chapter 6. Clerva then put the following letter into my hands. It was from my own Elizabeth. My dearest cousin, you have been very ill, very ill, and even the consult letters of dear kind Henry are not sufficient to reassure me on your account. You are forbidden to write to... to hold a pen. Yet one word from you, dear Victor, is necessary to calm our apprehensions. For a long time, I have thought that each post would bring this line, and my persuasions have restrained my uncle from undertaking, uh, undertaking a journey to Inglefleet. I have prevented his encountering the inconveniences and perhaps dangers of so long a journey, yet how often I have regretted not being able to perform it myself. I figure to myself that the task of attending on your sickbed has devolved on some mercenary old nurse, who could never guess your wishes to administer to them, with the care um, and affection of your poor cousin. Yet that is over now. Clerval writes that indeed you are getting better. I eagerly hope that you will confirm this intelligence soon in your own handwriting. Get well and return to us. You will find a happy, cheerful home and friends who love you dearly. Your father's health is vigorous and he asks but to see you, but to be assured that you are well and not, care, not a care will ever cloud his benevolent countenance. How pleased you would be to remark in the improvement of our earnest. He is now sixteen, and full of activity and spirit. He is desirous to be a true Swiss, and to enter into foreign service, but we cannot part with him, at least not until his elder brother um, returns to us. 
My uncle is not pleased with the idea of a military career in a distant country, but Ernest never had your powers of application. He looks upon study as an odious fetter. His time is spent in the open air, climbing the hills or rowing on the lake. I fear that he will become an idler unless we yield the point and permit him to enter on the profession which he has selected. Little alteration, except the growth of our dear children, has uh, taken place since you left us. The Blue Lake and Snow Climb Mountains. By the way, since I just realized it's kind of weird, the dear children, they're talking about um, um, Victor's um, younger siblings. They're, they're not... They're not... <laughs> they're not their children. Um, the Blue Lake and Snow Climb Mountains. We never change, and... I think our placid home and our contented hearts are regulated by the same immutable laws. My trifling occupations uh, take up my time and amuse me, and I am rewarded for any exhortations by seeing none but happy, kind faces around me. Since you left us, but one change has taken place in our little household. Do you remember on what occasion Justine Moritz um, entered her family? Probably you do not. I will relate her history, therefore, in a few words. Madame Moritz, her mother, was a widow with four children, of whom Justine was the third. This girl had always been the favorite of their father, but through a strange perversity, her mother could not endure her. And after the death of Anne, uh, of Anne Moritz, it treated her very ill. My aunt observed this, and when Justine was twelve years of age, prevailed on her mother to allow her to live at our house. The Republican institutions of our country have produced simpler and happier manners than those who which prevail in the great monarchies that surround it. Hence, there is, a, there is thus distinction between the several classes of its inhabitants, and the lower orders, being neither so poor nor so despised, their manners are more refined and moral. moral. A servant in Geneva does not mean the same thing as a servant in France and England. Justine, thus received in her family, learned the duties of a servant, a condition which, in a fortunate country, does not include the idea of ignorance and a sacrifice of the dignity of a human being. Justine, you may remember, was a great favorite of yours, and I recollect you once remarked that if you were in an ill humor, one glance from Justine could dissipate it, for the same reason that Ariosto, that Ariosto gives concerning the beauty of Angelica. Who? <laughs> she looked so frank-hearted and happy. My aunt conceived a great attachment for her, by which she was induced to give her an education superior to that which she had first intended. This benefit was fully repaid. Justine was the most grateful little creature in the world. I do not mean that she made any professions I never heard once pass her lips, but you could see in her eyes that she almost adored her protectress. Although her disposition was... Oh, though her disposition was gay, and in many respects inconsiderate, Yet she paid the greatest attention to every gesture of my aunt. She thought her the model of all excellence and endeavored to imitate her phraseology and manners. Um, so even now she often reminds me of her. Um, this aunt that um, this aunt that um, what's her name? Elizabeth talking about is Victor's mother. When my dear son died, uh, everyone was too much occupied in their own grief to notice poor Justine who attended to her during her illness with the most anxious affection. Poor Justine was very ill, but other trials were reserved for her. One by one, her brothers and sister died, and her mother, with the exception of a neglected daughter, was left childless. The conscience of the warden was troubled. She began the... She began to think that the deaths of her favorites was a judgment from heaven to chastise her partiality. She was a Roman Catholic, and I believe her confessor confirmed the idea which she had conceived. Accordingly, a few months after your departure for Englishlat, Justine was called home by her repentant mother. Poor girl, she wept when she quitted her our house. She was much altered since the death of my aunt. Grief had given softness and a winning mildness to her manners, which had before been remarkable for vivacity. Nor was her residence at her... Um, no was her residence at her mother's house of a nature to restore her gaiety. The poor woman was very facilitating uh, in her repentance. She sometimes begged Justine to forgive her unkindness, but much oftener accused her of 
uh, having caused the deaths of her brothers and sister, perpetually fretting at length uh, through metamorphs into a decline, which at first increased her irritability, but she is now at peace forever. She died on the first approach of cold winter, just at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of this last winter. Justine has just returned to us, and I assure you, I love her tenderly. She is very clever and gentle, and extremely pretty. As I mentioned before, her her mien and her expression continually remind me of my dear aunt. I must say also a few words to you, my dear cousin, of little darling William. I wish you could see him. He is very tall of his age, with sweet laughing blue eyes, dark eyelashes, and curling hair. When he smiles, two little dimples appear on each cheek, which are rosy with health. Um, he, has already one, ha he has already had one or two little wives, but Louisa Brion, uh, Louisa Brion is his favorite, a pretty little girl of five years of age. Now, dear Victor, I dare say you wish to be indulged in a little gossip concerning the good people of Geneva. The pretty Miss Mansfield has already received the congratulatory visits on her approaching marriage with a young Englishman, John Melbourne Esquire. <coughs> oh. Her ugly sister, Manon, married M. Delivered. I have a feeling that this M that they keep talking about is not an initial but, um, abbreviation for Mr. It makes sense. I'll try to use it from now on. Um, her ugly sister, Manon, married Mr. De, De, De Villard, the rich banker, last autumn. Your favorite schoolfellow, Louis Menor, has suffered several misfortunes since the departure of Clerval from Geneva. But he has already recovered his spirits and is reported to be on the point of marrying a lively, pretty French woman, Madame de Werner. She is a widow and much older than Manor, but she is very much admired with a favorite with everybody. I have written myself into better spirits, dear cousin, but my anxiety returns upon me as I conclude. Write, dearest Victor. One line, one word will be a blessing to us. Ten thousand thanks to Henry for his kindness, his affection, and his many letters. We are sincerely grateful. Adieu, my cousin. Take care of yourself, and I entreat you. Write! Elizabeth Lavenza. Geneva, March 18th, 17. Mm. Dear, dear Elizabeth, I exclaimed when I had read her letter. I will write instantly and relieve them from the anxiety, anxiety they must feel. I wrote, and this exertion greatly fatigued me, when my convalescence had commenced, and proceeded regularly. In another fortnight I was able to leave my chamber. One of my first duties on my recovery was to introduce Clerval to several professors of the university. In doing this, I underwent a kind of rough usage, ill befitting of the wounds my mind had sustained. Ever since that fatal night, the end of my labors, and the beginning of my misfortunes, I conceived of a violent antipathy even to the name of uh, natural philosophy. When I was otherwise quite restored to health, the sight of a chemical instrument would renew all the agony of my nervous systems. Henry saw this and had removed all my apparatus from my view. He had also changed my apartment, for he perceived that I had acquired a dislike for the room that had previously been my labor laboratory. But these cares of perfect of were made of no avail when I visited the professors. Mr. Wadman inflicted torture when he praised with kindness and warmth the astonishing progress I had made in the sciences. He soon perceived that I disliked the subject, but not guessing the real cause, he attributed my feelings to modesty and changed the subject for my improvement, through the science itself, the desire, as I evidently saw, of drawing me out. What could I do? He went to please, and he tormented me. I felt as if he had placed carefully, one by one, in my view those instruments which were to be afterward used in putting me to a slow and cruel death. I writhed under his words, yet dared not exhibit the pain I felt. Clerval, whose eyes and feelings were always quick in discerning the sensations of others, declined the subject, alleging, in excuse, his total ignorance, 
and the conversation took a more general turn. I thanked my friend from my heart, but I did not speak. I saw plainly that he was surprised, but he never attempted to draw my secret from me. And although I loved him with a mixture of affection and reverence that knew no bounds, yet I could never persuade myself to confide in him that event which was so often present to my recollection, but which I feared the detail to another would only impress more deeply. Mr. Crump was not equally docile, and in my... And in my condition at that time, of almost insupportable sensitiveness, his harsh but uh, encomiums, hmm? I don't know what that word is, gave me even more pain than the benevolent approbation of Mr. Wadman. Curse the fellow, cried he. Why, Mr. Clerval, I assure you, he has outscripted us all. I stare, if you please, but it is never the less true. The youngster who, but a few years ago, believed in Cornelius Agrippa as firmly as in the gospel, has now set himself at the head of the university, and if he is not soon pulled down, we shall all be out of countenance. Ay, ay, continued he, observing my face expressive of suffering. Mr. Frankenstein is modest, an excellent quality in a young man. Young men should be, uh, should be diff diffident of themselves, you know, Mr. Clerval. I was myself when young, but that without a very short time. Mr. Cramp had now come to the eulogy on himself, with happily turned the conversation from a subject that was so annoying to me. Clerval had never sympathized in my taste for natural science, and his literary pursuits differed wholly from those which had occupied me. He came to the mm, university with the desire to make himself the, master, the complete master of the Oriental languages, and thus he should open a field for the plan of life he had marked out for himself. Resolved to pursue no inglorious career, he turned his eyes towards the east, as affording scope for his spirit of enterprise. The Persian, Arabic, and Sanskrit languages engaged his attention, and I was easily induced to enter in the same studies. Idleness had never had ever been irksome to me, and now that I wished to fly from reflection and hated my former studies, I felt great relief in being the fellow pupil with my friend, and found not only the instruction but consolation in the works of the Orientalists. I did not, like him, attempt a critical knowledge of the dialects, for I did not contemplate making any other, other use of them than temporary amusement. I read them merely to understand their meaning, and they well repaid my labors. labors. Their melancholy is soothing, and their joy elevating, to a degree I never experienced in studying the authors of any other country. When you read their writings, life appears to consist in a warm sun and a garden of roses, in the smiles and frowns of a fair enemy and the fire that consumes your own heart. How different from the manly and hero heroical poetry of Greece and Rome. Summer passed away in these occupations, and my, return to Gen and my return to Geneva was fixed for the latter end of autumn. But being de delayed by several accidents, winter and snow arrived, the roads were deemed impassable, and my journey was, was delayed until the ensuing spring. I felt this delay very bitterly. For I longed to see my native town and my beloved friends, and my return had only been delayed so long, from an unwillingness to leave Clerval in a strange place, before he had become acquainted with any of its inhabitants. The winter, however, was spent cheerfully, and although the spring was uncommonly late, when, he came, when it came, its beauty compensated for its dilatoriness. The month of May had already commenced, and I expected the latter daily, the latter daily which was to fix the date of my departure. When Henry proposed a pedestrian tour in the environs of Ingolstadt, that I might bid a personal farewell to the country I had so long inhabited, I acceded to the pledge to this proposition. I was fond of exercise, and Clerval had always been my favorite companion in the rambles of this nature that I had taken among the scenes of my native country. He passed a fortnight in these perambulations. My health and spirits had long been restored, and I gained additional strength from the salubrious salubrious what in the salubrious air i breathe the natural incidents of our progress and the conversation of my friend study had before secluded me from the intercourse of my fellow creatures <laughs> and rendered me unsocial but clerval called forth the better feelings of my heart he again taught me to love the aspect of nature and the cheerful faces of children excellent friend how sincerely you did love me and endeavor me to elevate my mind until it was on a level with your own a selfish pursuit had cramped and narrowed me, until your gentleness and affection warmed and opened my senses. 
I became the same happy creature who, a few years ago, loved and beloved by all, had no sorrow or care. When happy, an animate nature had the power of bestowing on me the most delightful sensations. A serene sky and verdant fields um, filled me with ecstasy. The present season was indeed divine. The flowers of spring bloomed in the hedges, while those of summer were already in bud. I was undisturbed by thoughts which upon the preceding year had pressed upon me, notwithstanding my endeavors to throw them off with an invincible burden. Henry rejoiced in my gaiety, and sincerely synthesized in my feelings. Uh, he exerted himself to amuse me, while he expressed the sensations that filled his soul. The resources of his mind on this occasion were truly astonishing. His conversation was full of imagination, and very often, in imitation of the Persian and Arabic writers, he invented tales of wonderful fancy and passion. At other times, he repeated my favorite poems, or drew me out into arguments, which... Um, which he supported with great ingenuity. We returned to our college on a Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon. The peasants were dancing, and every one we met appeared gay and happy. My own spirits were high, and I bounded along with feelings of unbridled joy and hilarity. As I turned the page, um, I saw in the next page accidentally something that totally contrasts with this. So that's chapter six. Um, is another transitional chapter. Um, basically, he has a letter from Elizabeth telling him to write. And, yeah, he's much healthier and happier now, at least a little bit uneasy. Let me just quickly write that down. Chapter 7. On my return, I found the following letter from my father. My dear Victor, you have probably waited impatiently for a letter to fix the date of your return to us, and I was tempted at first to write only a few lines, merely mentioning the day on which I should expect you. But that would be a cruel kindness, and I dare not do it. What would be your surprise, my son, when you expected a happy and glad welcome to behold, on the contrary, tears and wretchedness? And how, Victor, can I relate our misfortune? Absence can I, cannot have rendered you callous to our joys and grief. And how shall I inflict pain on my long absent son? I wish to prepare you for the woeful news, but I know it is impossible. Even now your eye skims over the page to seek the words which are to convey you the horrible tidings. William's dead. That sweet child whose smiles delighted and warmed my heart, who was so gentle yet so gay. Victor, he was murdered. I will not attempt to console you, but I will simply relate the circumstances of the transaction. Last Thursday, May 7th, I, my niece, and your two brothers went to walk in Plain Colors. The evening was warm and serene, and we prolonged our walk further than, I, than usual. Sorry, I got distracted. Um, it was already dusk before we thought of returning, and then we discovered that William and Ernest, who had gone on before, were not to be found. We, we accordingly requested rest. We accordingly rested on a seat until they should return. Presently, Ernest came and inquired if we had seen his brother. He said that he had been playing with him, that William had run away to hide himself, and that he vainly sought for him. And afterwards, he waited for a long time, but that he did not return. This account rather alarmed us, and we continued to search for him until night fell, when Elizabeth conjectured that he might have returned to the house. He was not there. We returned again with torches, for I could not rest when I thought that my sweet boy had lost himself. And was exposed to the damps and dews of night, Elizabeth also suffered extreme anguish. 
About five in the morning, I discovered my lovely boy. And the night before, I had seen him living and active in health, stretched on a grass, limpid and motionless. The print of the murderous finger was on his neck. He was conveyed home, and the anguish that was visible in my countenance betrayed the secret to Elizabeth. She was very earnest to see the corpse. At first, I attempted to prevent her, but she persisted, and entering the room where it lay, hastily examined the neck of the victim, and clasping her hands, exclaimed, Oh, God, I have murdered my darling child. She fainted and was restored with extreme difficulty. When she again lived, it was only to weep and sigh. She told me that the same evening, William had teased her to let him wear a very valuable miniature that she possessed of your mother. Thus, this picture is gone, and was doubtless the temptation which urged the murderer of it to the deed. Uh, we have no trace of him at present. Although our exertions to discover him are unremitted, but they will not restore my beloved William. Come, dearest Victor, you alone can counsel, con console Elizabeth. She weeps continually and accuses herself unjustly as the cause of his death. Her words pierce my heart. We are all unhappy, but you will not. Uh, but you will not that be an additional. But but will not that. But won't that be an additional motive for you, my son, to return and be our comforter? Oh, your dear mother. Alas, Victor, I now say, thank God she did not live to witness the cruel, miserable death of her youngest darling. Come, Victor, now brooding thoughts of vengeance against the assassin, but with feelings of peace and gentleness that will heal to the festering the wounds of our minds. Enter the house of mourning, my friend, but with kindness and affection for those who love you and not with hatred for your enemies. Your affectionate and afflicted father, Alphonse Frankenstein. Geneva, May 12th, 17... Clerval, who had watched my countenance as I read this letter, was surprised to observe the despair that succeeded the joy I had first received on receiving news of my friend. I threw the letter on the table and covered my face with my hands. My dear Frankenstein, exclaimed Henry, when he perceived me weeped with bitterness. Why, are you always, um, are you always to be unhappy? My dear friend, what has happened? I motioned him to take up the letter while I walked up and down the room in the extremest agitation. Tears also gushed from the eyes of Clerval, as he read the account of my misfortune. I can offer you no consolation, my friend, said he. Your disaster is irreparable. What do you intend to do? To go once today to Geneva. Come with me, Henry, to order the horses. During our walk, Clerval endeavored to say a few words of consolation. He could only express his heartfelt sympathy. Poor William, said he, to your lovely child, he now sleeps with his angel mother, who that had seen him bright and joyous in his young beauty, but must weep over his untimely loss, to die so miserably, to feel the murderer's grasp, how much more a murdered that could destroy radiant innocence. Poor little fellow, one only consolation have we, his friends mourn and weep, but he is at rest, the, pa the pang is over, his sufferings are at an end forever. Sod covers his gentle form, and he knows no pain. He can no longer be a subject for pity. He must reserve that for his miserable survivors. Clever spoke thus as we hurried through the streets. The words impressed themselves on my mind, and I remembered them afterwards in solitude. But now, as soon as the horses arrived, I hurried into a cabriolet, and bade farewell to my friend. My journey was very melancholy. At first I wished to hurry on, for I longed to console and sympathize my loved and sorrowing friends. When I drew near my native town, I slackened my progress. I could hardly sustain the multitude of feelings that crowded into my mind. I passed through scenes familiar to my youth, but which I had not seen for nearly six years. How altered everything might be during that time, one sudden and desolating change had taken place. By a thousand little circumstances, um, might have by degrees worked other alterations which, although they were done more tranquilly, might not be the less decisive. Fear overcame me. I dared no advance. Uh, 
dreading a thousand nameless evils that made me tremble, although I was unable to define them. I remained two days in Lausanne, in this painful state of mind. I contemplated the lake. The waters were placid. All around me was calm in the snowy mountains. The palaces of nature were not changed. By the grace of the calm and heavenly scene restored me, and I continued my journey towards Geneva. The road ran by the side of the lake, which became narrower as I approached my native town. I discovered more distinctly the black sides of Jura and the, west, the bright summit of Mont Blanc. I whooped like a child. Dear mountains, my own beautiful lake, how do you welcome your wanderer? Your summits are clear, the sky and lake are blue and placid. Is this to prognosticate peace or to mock at my unhappiness? I fear, my friend, that I shall render myself to you by dwelling on these preliminary circumstances. But they were days of comparative happiness, and I think them with pleasure. My country, my beloved country, who but a native can tell the delight I took in again beholding thy streams, thy mountains, and more than all, thy lovely lake. And as I drew nearer home, grief and fear again overcame me. Night also closed around, and when I could hardly see the dark mountains, I still felt more gloomy. The picture appeared vast and dim scene of evil, and I foresaw obscurely that I was destined to become the most wretched of human beings. Alas! I prophesied, I prophesied truly, and failed only in one single circumstance, that in all the misery I imagined and dreaded, I did not see the hundredth part of the anguish I was destined to endure. Basically, he's saying that it gets worse. It was completely dark when I arrived in the environs of Geneva. The gates of the town were already shut, and I was obliged to pass the night at Sechiron, a village at the distance of half a league from the city. The sky was serene, and as I was unable to rest, I resolved to visit the spot where my poor William had been murdered. As I could not pass through the town, I was obliged to cross the lake in a boat to arrive at Plain Place. During this for short voyage, I saw the lightning playing on the summit of Mont Blanc in the most beautiful figures. The storm appeared to approach rapidly, and on landing, I ascended a low hill that I might observe its progress. It advanced. The heavens were clouded, and I soon felt the rain coming slowly in large drops, but its violence quickly increased. I quitted my seat and walked on. Although the darkness and storm increased every minute, and the thunder burst with a terrific crash over my head. It was echoed from Salive, uh, the Juras of the Alps of Savoy. Vivid flashes of lightning dazzled my eyes, illuminating the lake, making it appear like a vast sheet of fire. Then, for an instant, everything seemed like pitchy darkness, until the eye recovered itself from the preceding flash. The storm, as is often the case in Switzerland, appeared at once in various parts of the heavens. The most violent storm hung exactly north of the town, over the part of the lake which lies between the promontory of Bellarive and the village of Cope. Another storm enlightened Jura with the faint flashes, and another darkened and sometimes disclosed a mole, a peaked mountain to the east of the lake. While I watched the tempest so beautiful yet terrific, I wandered on with a hasty step. This noble war in the sky elevated my spirit. I clasped my hands and exclaimed aloud, William, dear angel, this is thy funeral, this is thy dirge. As I said these words, I perceived in the gloom a figure which stole from behind a clump of trees near me. I stood fixed, gazing intensely. I could not be mistaken. A flash of lightning illuminated the object and discovered its shape plainly, plainly to me. Its gigantic stature and the deformity of its aspect more hideous than belongs to humanity instantly informed me that it was the wretch, the filthy demon to whom I had given life. What did he there? Could he be, I shudder at the conception, the murderer of my brother? No sooner that idea crossed my imagination than I became convinced of its truth. My teeth chattered and I was forced to lean against a tree for support. The figure passed me quickly, and I lost it in the gloom. Nothing in human shape could have destroyed that fair child. She was the murderer. I could not doubt it. The mere presence of the idea was an irresistible proof of the fact. I thought of pursuing the devil, but it would have been in vain, for another flash discovered him. For the, another flash discovered him to me, hanging among the rocks at the nearly perpendicular ascent of the Montsalive, a hill that bounds a plain place of the, on the south. He soon reaches the summit and disappears. So the monster 
kill his brother. At least that's what he thinks. Probably true. remained motionless. The thunder ceased, but the rain still continued, and the scene was enveloped in an impenetrable darkness. I revolved in my mind the events which I had until now sought to forget, the whole train of my progress towards the creation, the appearance of my works in my own hands at my bedside, its departure. Two years had now nearly elapsed since the night on which he first received light, and was this his first crime? Alas, I had turned loose into the world a depraved wretch whose delight was in carnage and misery, had he not murdered my brother? No one can conceive of the anguish I suffered during the remainder of the night which I spent, cold and wet in the open air. But I did not feel the inconvenience of the weather. My imagination was busy in scenes of evil and despair. I considered the being whom I had cast among mankind, and endowed with the will and power to effect purposes of horror, such as the deed which he had now done. Merely in the light of my own vampire, my own spirit let loose from the grave, and forced to destroy all that was dear to me. Day dawned, and I directed my steps towards the town. The, ga the gates were opened, and I hastened to my father's house. My first thought was to discover that I knew what I knew of the murder, her, and, and caused instant pursuit to be made. But I paused when I reflected on the story that I had to tell. A being whom I myself had formed and endued with life had met me at midnight among the precipices, precipices of an inaccessible mountain. I remembered also the nervous fever which I had been seized just at the time that I dated my creation, and which would give an air of delirium to a tale otherwise so utterly improbable. I knew, I well knew, that if any other had communicated such a relation to me. I should have looked upon it as the ravings of insanity. Besides, the strange nature of the animal would elude all pursuit, even I were so far credited as to persuade my relatives to commence it. And then, of what use would be the pursuit? Who could arrest a creature capable of scaling the overhanging sides of Mont Blanc, of Mont Saint Leave? Um, these reflections terminated me, determined me, and I resolved to remain silent. It was about five in the morning when I entered my father's house, told the servants not to disturb the family, and I went into the library to attend the, the usual hour of rising. Six years had elapsed and passed in a dream, but but one indelible trace. I stood in the same place where I had last embraced my father before my departure for Ingolstadt. Beloved and venerable parent, so remained to me. I gazed on the picture of my mother, which stood over the mantelpiece. It was a it was an it was a historical subject. Then at my father's desire and were presented Caroline Beaufort in an agony of despair. Kneeling by the coffin of her dead father, her garb was rustic and her cheek pale, but there was an air of dignity and beauty that hardly permitted the sentiment of pity. Below this picture was a miniature of William, and my tears flowed when I looked upon it. While I was thus engaged, Ernest entered. He had heard me arrive and hastened to welcome me. "'Welcome, my dearest Victor,' said he. I wish you had come three months ago, then you would have found us all joyous and delighted. You have come to us now to share a misery which nothing can alleviate. But your presence will, I hope, revive our father, who seems sinking under his misfortune. And your persuasions will induce poor Elizabeth to cease her vain and tormenting self-accusations. Self-accusation. Poor William, he was her darling and her pride. Tears, unrestrained, fell from my brother's eyes. A sense of moral agony. A sense of moral mortal agony crept over my frame. Before I had only imagined the wretchedness of my desolated home, the reality came on me as a new and a not less terrible disaster. I tried to calm Ernest. I inquired more minutely concerning my father, and here I named my cousin. She, most of all, said Ernest, requires consolation. She accused herself of having caused the death of my brother and that made her very wretched. But since the murder has been discovered, the murderer discovered? But God, how can that be? Who could attempt to pursue him? It is impossible. One might as well try to overtake the winds, or confine a mountain stream with a straw, 
I saw him too. He was free last night. I don't know what you mean, replied my brother in accents of wonder. But to us the discovery we have made completes our misery. No one will believe it at first, and even now Elizabeth will not be convinced, notwithstanding all the evidence. Indeed, who would credit that Justine Moritz, who was so amiable and fond of all the family, could suddenly become so capable of so frightful, so appalling a crime? Justine Moritz? Poor, poor girl, she is the accused, but it is wrongfully. Everyone knows that. No one believes it. Surely, Ernest. No one did at first, but several circumstances came out that have almost forced conviction upon us and her own behavior has been so confused as to add the evidence of facts to wait that i fear there is no hope for doubt she will be tried today and you will then hear all he then related that the morning on which the murder of poor william had been discovered justine had been taken ill and confined to her bed for several days During this interval, one of the servants, happening to examine the apparel she had worn on the night of the murder, had discovered in her pocket the picture of my mother, which had been judged to be the temptation of the murderer. The servant instantly showed it to one of the others, who, without saying any word of any without saying word to any of the family, went to a magistrate and upon the deposition, Justine was apprehended. On being charged with the fact, the poor girl confirmed the suspicion in a great measure by her extreme confusion of manner. Okay, she didn't um say it directly. Well, you would you call her for my notes? Um, she didn't seem like a servant girl. I'll just call her a servant girl because she said she knows that I do. This was a strange tale, but I did not shake my faith, and I replied earnestly. You are all mistaken. I know the murderer. Justine, poor good Justine, is innocent. At that instant, my father entered. I saw unhappiness deeply impressed on his countenance, but he endeavored to welcome me cheerfully. And after we exchanged a mournful greeting, would have introduced some other topic than that of a disaster, and Ernest not exclaimed, Good God, Papa! Victor says that he knows who was the murderer of poor William. We do also, unfortunately, replied my father. For indeed I have I had rather been for indeed I had rather have been forever ignorant than have discovered so much depravity and ingratitude in one of ours so highly. My dear father, you are mistaken. Justine is innocent. If she is, God forbid that she should suffer as guilty. She is to be tried today, and I hope, I sincerely hope that she will be acquitted. His speech calmed me, and I was fir firmly convinced in my own mind that Justine, and indeed every human being, was guiltless of this murder. I had no fear, therefore, that any circumstantial evidence could be brought forward strong enough to convict her. My tale was not one to announce publicly. This astounding horror would be looked upon as madness by the vulgar. Did anyone exist, except I, the creator who would believe, unless his senses convinced him, in the existence of the living monument which presumption and rash ignorance which I had let loose upon the world? We were soon joined by Elizabeth. Time had altered her since I last beheld her, and had endowed her with loveliness surpassing the beauty of her childish years. There was the same candor, the same vivacity, but it was allied to an expression more full of sensibility and intellect. She welcomed me with the greatest affection. Your arrival, my dear cousin, said she, Fills me with hope. You perhaps will find some means to justify my poor guiltless destiny. Alas, who is safe if she is to be convicted of crime? I rely on her innocence as certainly as I do upon my own. Our misfortune is doubly hard to us. We have not only lost that lovely darling boy, 
but this poor girl, whom I sincerely love, is to be torn away by even a worse fate. If she is condemned, I shall never shall know joy more. But she will not. I'm sure she will not. And then I will be happy again, even after the sad death of my little William. She is innocent, my Elizabeth, said I. And that shall be proved. Fear nothing, but to let your spirits be cheered by the assurance of her acquittal. How kind and generous you are. Everyone else believes in her guilt. And that made me wretched, for I knew that it was impossible. And to see everyone else prejudiced in so deadly a manner rendered me hopeless and despairing. She wept. Dearest niece, said my father, dry your tears. If she is, as I believe, innocent, rely on the justice of our laws, and the activity which I shall prevent the slightest shadow of partiality. In chapter 7. So, summarize this chapter. Um, he gets a letter saying that his youngest brother is murdered. And he goes to Worcester into Geneva. While at the scene of the murder, he sees the monster and believes it, him, I don't know, to be the murderer and finds out at home that the royal servant girl Justine Moritz had been accused. Let's move on. <coughs> Chapter 8 We passed a few sad hours until 11 o'clock, when the trial was to, be, was to commence. My father and the rest of the family, being obliged to attend as witnesses, I uh, accompanied them to the court. During the whole of this wretched mockery of justice, I suffered living torture. It was to be decided whether the result of my curiosity and lawless devices would cause the death of my two fellow beings, one a smiling babe full of innocence and joy, the other far more dreadfully murdered. With every aggravation of infamy that could make the murder memorable in horror, Justine was also a girl in marriage and possessed qualities which was promised to render her life happy. Now all was to be obliterated in an ignominious grave, and I had the cause. A thousand times rather would I have confessed myself guilty of the crime ascribed to Justine, but I was absent when it was committed, and such a declaration would have been instead of the ravings of a madman, and would not have exculpated her uh, who suffered through me. The appearance of Justine was calm. She was dressed in mourning, and her countenance, always engaging, was rendered, by the solemnity of her feelings, exquisitely beautiful. Yet she did not appear yet she appeared confident in innocence and did not tremble, although gazed on and ex execrated by thousands, for all the kindness which her beauty might otherwise have excited was obliterated in the minds of the spectators by the imagination of the enormi enormity she was supposed to have committed. She was tranquil, yet her tranquility was evidently constrained, and as her confusion had before been adduced uh, as a proof of her guilt, she worked up her mind to an appearance of courage. When she entered the court, she threw her eyes round it and quickly discovered where we were seated. A tear seemed to dim her eye when she saw us, but she quickly recovered herself, and a look of sorrowful um, affection seemed to attest her under guiltlessness. The trial began, and after the advocate against her had stated the charge, several witnesses were called. Several strange facts combined against her, which might have staggered any one who had not had such proof of her innocence as I had. She had been out the whole of the night on which the murder had been committed, and towards morning had been perceived by a market woman not far from the spot where the body of the murdered child had been afterwards found. The woman asked her what she did there, but she looked very strangely and only returned confused and unintelligible answer. She returned to the house about eight o'clock, and when one inquired where she had passed the night, she replied that she had been looking for the child and demanded earnestly if anything had been heard concerning them. When shown the body, she fell into violent hysterics and kept her bed for several days. 
The picture was then produced, which the servant has found in her pocket. And when Elizabeth, in a faltering voice, proved that it was the same which, an hour before the child had been missed, she had placed on his neck, a murmur of horror and indignation filled the court. Justine was called on for her defense. As the trial had proceeded, her countenance had altered. Surprise, horror, and misery were strongly expressed. Sometimes she struggled with her tears, but when she was desired to plead, she collected her powers and spoke in an audible, although variable, voice. God knows, she knows, she said, how entirely I am innocent. But I do not pretend that my protestations should acquit me. I rest my innocence on a plain and simple explanation of the facts which have been adduced against me, and I hope the character I have had always borne will incline my judges to a favorable interpretation, where any circumstance appears doubtful or suspicious. She then related that, by the permission of Elizabeth, she had passed the evening of the night on which the murder had been committed at the house of an aunt at Shen, a village, village situated at the, a village situated at about a league from Geneva. On her return at about nine o'clock, she met a man who asked her if she had seen anything in the child who was lost. She was alarmed by this account and passed several hours in looking for him, when the gates of Geneva were shut, and she was forced to remain several hours of the night. Um, in a barn belonging to a cottage, being unwilling to call up the inhabitants, to whom she was well known. Most of the night she had spent here watching. Towards the morning she believed that she slept for a few minutes. Some steps disturbed her, and she awoke. It was dawn, and she, acquitted, and she quitted her asylum, that she might again endeavor to find my brother. If she had gone near the spot where his body lay, it was without her knowledge. That she had been bewildered when questioned by the market women was not surprising, since she had passed in a sleepless night, and the fate of poor William was yet uncertain. Concerning the picture, she could give no account. I know, said, continued the unhappy victim, how heavily and fatally this one circumstance weighs against me, but I have no power of explaining it, and when I have expressed my utter ignorance, I am only left to conjecture concerning the probabilities by which it might have been placed in my pocket. But here, also, I am checked. I believe that I have no enemy on earth, and none truly would have been so wicked as to destroy me once in me. Did the murderer place it there? I knew of no opportunity afforded him for doing so. Or, if I had, why should he have stolen his jewel, pro with this again so soon? I commit my cause to the justice of my judges, and I see no room for hope. I beg permission to have a few witnesses examined concerning my character, and if their testimony shall not overweigh my supposed guilt, I must be condemned, although I will pledge my salvation on my innocence. Several witnesses were called who had known her for many years, and they spoke well of her, but fear and hatred of the crime of which they supposed her guilty rendered them timorous and unwilling to come forward. Elizabeth saw even this last resource, her excellent dispositions and irreproachable conduct, about to fail the accused, when, although violently agitated, she desired permission to adjust to court. I am, said she, the cousin of the unhappy child who was murdered, or rather her sister, for I was educated by and have lived with his parents forever, uh, ever since and even long before his birth. It may never be judged indecent in me to come forward on this occasion, but when I see a fellow creature about to perish through the cowardice of her pretended friends, I wish to be allowed to speak, so I may say what I know of her character. I am well acquainted uh, with the accused. I lived in the same house over there, at one time for five, and at another for nearly two years. During all that period, she appeared to me the most amiable and benevolent of human creatures. She nursed Madame Frankenstein, my aunt, in her last illness, with the greatest affection and care, and afterwards attended her own mother during her tedious illness, in a manner that excited the admiration of all who knew her, after which she again lived in my uncle's house, where she was beloved by all the family. She was warmly attached to the child who was now dead, and acted towards him like a most affectionate mother. For my own part, I do not hesitate to say that, notwithstanding all the evidence produced against her, I believe... Um, and rely on her perfect innocence. She had no temptation for such an action. As to the bauble on which the chief proof rests, if she had earnestly desired it, I should have willingly given it to her. 
So much do I esteem and value her. A murmur of approbation followed Elizabeth's simple and powerful appeal, but I was excited by her generous interference and not in favor of poor Justine, on whom the public indignation was turned with renewed violence, charging her uh, with the blackest ingratitude. She herself wept as Elizabeth spoke, but she did not answer. My own agitation and anguish was extreme during the whole trial. I believed in her innocence. I knew it. Could the demon who had, I said, I did not for a minute doubt, murder my brother, also in his hellish sport, have betrayed the innocent to death and an ignominy? <laughs> I could not sustain the horror of my situation, and when I perceived that the popular voice and the countenances of the judge, of the judges had already condemned my unhappy victim, I rushed out of the court in agony. The tortures of the accused did not equal mine. She was sustained by innocence, but the fangs of remorse tore my bosom and would not forego their hold. I passed a night of unmingled wretchedness. In the morning, I went to the court. My lips and throat were parched. I dared not ask the fatal question, but I was known, and the officer guessed the cause of my visit. The ballots had been thrown. They were all black, and Justine was condemned. I cannot pretend to describe, then, what I felt. I had before experienced sensations of horror, and I have endeavored to bestow upon them adequate expression. But words cannot convey the idea of the heart sickening despair that I then endured. The person to whom I addressed myself added that Justine had already confessed her guilt. That evidence, he observed, was hardly required in so glaring a case, but I'm glad of it. And indeed, none of our judges like to condemn a criminal upon circumstantial evidence, be it ever so decisive. This was strange and unexpected intelligence. What could I mean? Had my eyes deceived me? And was I really as mad as the whole world would believe me to be if I disclosed the object of my suspicions? I hastened to return home, and, the and Elizabeth eagerly demanded the result. My cousin, replied I, it is decided as you may have expected. All judges had rather that ten innocent should suffer uh, than one guilty should escape, for she has confessed. This was a dire blow to poor Elizabeth, who had relied with firmness upon Justine's innocence. Alas, says she, how shall I ever again believe in human goodness? Justine, who I loved and esteemed as my sister, how could she put on the smiles of innocence only to betray her mild eyes seemed incapable of any severe guile, and yet she has committed a murder. Soon after we heard that the poor victim had expressed a desire to see my cousin. My father wished her not to go, but said that he left it to her own judgment and feelings to decide. Yes, said Elizabeth, I will go, although she is guilty, and you, Victor, shall accompany me. I cannot go alone. The idea of this visit was torture to me, yet I could not refuse. We entered the gloomy prison chamber and beheld the Justine sitting on some straw at the farther end. Her hands were man manacled, and her head rested on her knees. She rose on seeing us enter. And when we were left alone with her, she threw herself at the feet of Elizabeth, weeping bitterly. My cousin wept also. Oh, Justine, says she, why did you rob me of my last consolation? I relied on your innocence, and although I was then very wretched, I was not so miserable as I am now. And do you also believe that I am so very, very wicked? Do you also join with my enemies to crush me, to condemn me as a murderer? Her voice was suffocated with sobs. Rise, my poor girl, said Elizabeth. Why do you kneel if you are innocent? I am not one of your enemies. I believed you guiltless, notwithstanding every anything, until I learned that you yourself declared your guilt. My report you say is false, and be assured, dear Justine, nothing can shake my confidence in you for a moment own confession. I did confess, but I confessed a lie. I confessed that I might obtain absolution. But now that falsehood lies heavier at my heart than all my other sins, the God of heaven forgive me. Ever since I was condemned, my confessor has besieged me. He threatened and menaced until I always began to think that I was the monster that he said I was. He threatened excommunication and hellfire in my last moments if I continued to obdurate. Dear lady, I had none to support me. All looked on me as a wretch doomed to ignominy and perdition. What could I do? 
in an evil hour and subscribe to a lie and not only I am truly miserable. He paused, weeping, and then continued. I thought with horror my sweet lady made you believe your Justine, whom your blessed aunt had so highly honored and whom you loved was a creature capable of a crime which none but the devil himself could have perpetrated. Dear William, dear blessed child, I soon shall see you again in heaven, which we shall all be happy, and that consoles me, going as I am to suffer ignominy and death. Oh, Justine, forgive me for having one moment to stress with you. Why did you confess? But do not mourn, dear girl. Do not fear. I will proclaim, I will prove your innocence. I will melt the stony hearts of your enemies. By my tears and prayers, you shall not die. You, my playfellow, my companion, my sister, perish on the scaffold. No, no, I never could survive so horrible a misfortune. Justine shook her head mournfully. I do not fear to die, she said. The pang is past. God raises my weakness and gives me courage to endure the worst. I leave a sad and bitter world, and if you remember me and think of me as one unjustly condemned, I am resigned to the fate awaiting me. Learn from me, dear lady, to submit in patience to the will of heaven. During this conversation, I had retired to a corner of the prison room, where I could conceal the horrid anguish that possessed me. Despair, we talked of that. The poor victim, who on the morrow was to pass the awful boundary between life and death, felt not, as I did, such deep and bitter agony. I gnashed my teeth and ground them together, uttering a groan. Uh, uttering a groan that came from my inmost soul, Justine's chair. When she saw who it was, she approached me and said, Dear sir, you are very kind to visit me. You, I hope, do not believe that I am guilty. I could not answer. No, you just seen, said Elizabeth. He was more convinced of your innocence than I was, for even when he heard that you had confessed it, he did not credit it. I truly thank him. In these last moments, I feel the sincerest gratitude towards those who forgive me the kindness. How sweet is the affection of others to such a wretch as I am. It removes more than half my misfortune, and I feel as if I could die in peace now that my innocence is acknowledged by you, dear lady, and your cousin. Thus the poor sufferer tried to comfort others and herself. She indeed gained the resignation she desired, but I, the true murderer, felt the never-dying worm alive in my bosom, which allowed no hope of consolation. Elizabeth also wept and was unhappy. But hers also was the misery of innocence, which, like a cloud that passes over the fair moon, for a while hides but cannot tarnish a brightness. Anguish and despair had, present, had penetrated into the core of my heart. I bore a hell within me which nothing could extinguish. We stayed several hours with Justine, and it was with great difficulty that Elizabeth could tear herself, um, that Elizabeth could tear herself away. I wish, cried she, that I were to die with you. I cannot live in this world with the misery. Justine had seemed an air of cheerfulness, while she with difficulty repressed her bitter tears. She embraced Elizabeth and said in a voice of half-suppressed emotion, Farewell, sweetest friend. Uh, farewell, sweet lady, dearest Elizabeth, my beloved and only friend. May heaven and its bounty bless and preserve you. May this be the last misfortune that you will ever suffer. Live and be happy and make others so. And on the morrow, Justine died. Elizabeth's heart-rending eloquence failed to move the judges from their subtle conviction in the criminality of the saintly sufferer. My passionate and indignant appeals were lost upon them, and when I received their cold answers in the heard of the harsh, unfeeling reasoning of these men, my purposed avowal died away on my lips. Thus I may proclaim myself a madman, but not revoke the sentence passed upon my wretched victim. She perished on the scaffold as a murderess. From the tortures of my own heart, I turned to contemplate the grief and voices of grief of my Elizabeth. This was also my doing, and my father's woe, and the desolation of that late so smiling home, all was the work of my thrice accursed hands. You weep, unhappy ones, but these are not your last tears. Again shall you raise the funeral wail, 
the sound of your lamentations shall again and again be heard. Frankenstein, your son, your kinsman, your early much loved friend, he who would spend each vital drop of blood for your sakes, who has no thought nor sense of joy except as it is mirrored also in your dear countenances, would fill the air with blessings and spend his life in serving you. He bids you to weep. He shed countless tears, happy beyond his hopes. If thus inexorable fate be satisfied, and if, the if, and if the destruction pause before the peace of the grave have succeeded to your sad torments. Thus spoke my prophetic soul, as torn by remorse, horror, and despair, and beheld those I love spend vain sorrow upon the graves of William and Justine, the first hapless victims to my unhallowed arts. End of chapter 8. So, in summary, that's the um, the triumph of the Queen Norwich. Although she is innocent, I believe she's innocent. Um, I feel like this whole story is about. Falling a man, trifling with what they shouldn't, and it coming back to bite them. I I typed in my notes. Victor feels bad. And I wanted to type a frowny face, but I hit the wrong button and it was a smiley face. <laughs> Victor feels bad. Smile. <laughs> but, so today we read chapter 4 through 8. That's four chapters. Basically what happened, he, he, um, finds out how to animate life and then ends up creating working on making a man animated from human hands and he succeeds oh my voice is so dry and he succeeds in doing this um but as soon as he does he feels immense regret and basically has a nervous breakdown because of it I think it was like two years it said um he was going through this but um eventually he, he gets a letter from his sister asking him to write to him and they like work together to find um a date which he wants to come back at um but then he gets a letter from his father saying that his um his brother was murdered so he goes back right away and on the night before he sees his family again he sees the monster that he created. I forgot to say, the monster, it left, went off to do other things. So he sees the monster he created and, and like a, the place like just outside his, his town. And, um, and then he realizes that the monster killed his brother. He goes back to his family and his other brother says that the, the servant girl, I don't really know what, what her, role is in the house but the, um, the girl who is part of the family Justine um, she was mm, falsely accused of murder and then the trial happens and then she is convicted as guilty and then um, executed so yeah and then basically the chapter 8 basically it ends with saying that um, things have been bad but they're gonna get much worse <laughs> So I'm really excited to see just how much worse things get for our man. Um, yeah. <laughs> but for now, um, I'm gonna end things off here. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I hope you enjoyed today's stream. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm so tired right now, so like, I'm a little bit in a daze. 
But, um, I guess it's just self promote. Yeah. That's what people do. <laughs> Make sure you follow me on Twitter at MarchingMazelle. I post, um, Kuso posts. And if I'm not doing that, I retweet Hoseki no Kuni pictures. Um, also, this has been sitting on the top right of my screen the entire stream. Um, but there is a new video coming out tomorrow evening, 9 p.m. EST. No idea what that is in other time zones. Google it. <laughs> um, but it is a Hoseki no, Muni, no, no, Hoseki no Kuni video. Um, it is one rock fact about every gem in Hoseki no Kuni. Um, I work really hard on that video. It's like my first video of that type of nature, like, um, a edited video. Um, so please check that out. There's Mario music in it. <laughs> I'm most impressed by the Mario music. <laughs> but yeah, go please check that out. It'll be a premiere, and yeah. Um, boy there, subscribe to me on YouTube. Uh, oh, while you're still here, on Twitch, slap that follow button. I tell you to donate to me, but, um, you can't do that right now. <laughs> donate to me your fellowship. Um, and that's all. Um, and make sure when you go to sleep tonight, you dream about me. Okay, Broadcasting Life, I'm 1855. It's your lady, Marcia Nazelle, signing off.